Well, you can see on the screen, I have one last message to share with you with regard to issues of the end times. Eschatology is the study of last things. We're going to be in 2 Thessalonians, and this is a a difficult text, so uh, follow with me if you can, and uh, I'll give it my best shot, and I'm open to uh, counsel in any way on this particular text. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we're going to be. Before we get there in 2 Thessalonians, I want you to see the opening verse of verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians. Look at this, if you would. Paul and Silvanus, Silas, in other words, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness in our, of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. Now, in verse 3, would you notice Paul identifies three Christian virtues that were very active in the lives of these young believers, faith, love, and hope. These virtues in the life of every Christian, they are meant to motivate us, as it says here, faith will cause you to work. Love will cause you to labor, to go the extra mile. And hope will help you, as it says, to be steadfast. So that's the life of this church. Now, on the other hand, about six to eight months later, Paul writes the second letter to these Thessalonians And I want you to notice carefully this introduction. Excuse me. Paul and Silas, Timothy to the church. Very similar, grace, peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting because of your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Now, I wonder, I see faith, I see love, what's missing? There's no mention here of hope. Something has happened in very recent months to affect the hope of these Christians. That's really why Paul has written this letter in the first place. Hope has to do with expectations with regard to the future. So something has happened to dampen their uh, expectations with regard to the future. Now, to be particular about their hope, Paul will define this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. He identifies their hope. Uh, First, in verse 9, Paul is admonishing these believers because he says, notice, you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Uh, Before I go any further, notice the order of this. You turned to God from idols. Don't mess with that order. It's not you turn from idols to God. That's called legalism. That's religion. You turn to God, and then God helps you to turn away from the idols. That's the idea. We have to be careful that we always have this accurate perspective. So look at this again. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait 
for his son from heaven, whom he, rest, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Now that last statement there is very important to us. Jesus rescues us from, not in, but from the wrath to come. And so there is a wrath that is to come. And clearly, based on, this, uh, based on the context of this letter, this is not referring to hell. That's not what this is about. There's no question this is talking about something else. For example, let me show you this in Matthew 24. Jesus here is talking about a time, a coming time. He says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, notice it's visual, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet. We saw it weeks ago in Daniel 9. Standing in the holy place, that means standing in the temple of God. And then he adds, notice, let the reader understand. So there is this abomination of desolation. Daniel is saying essentially that there is a man who will come and he will commit the ultimate crime of blasphemy against God. Now, in this chapter, this is verse 15, in verse 16 through 20, Jesus will speak parenthetically to the Jewish people about issues related to this abomination concern. And then he says in verse 21, look at this, for then there will be great tribulation. Do you see what I'm saying? In verse 15, he lays out this abomination of desolation. He speaks parenthetically to the Jewish people. And then he says, for then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Now, verse 21, this is an event that is yet to occur in history. And as you can see, this is a time that is so dramatic and so awful that if God did not step in and put an end to things, the suggestion is that man would literally wipe himself out off of the face of the earth. Now, if you think about this, based on an honest evaluation and analysis of human history, there is no way you can say this has been fulfilled. just can't be. Uh, World War II was pretty dramatic. I mean, there were millions and millions of people who were killed, but this is something that is more extreme than even that. And so this is something then that is yet to be in the future. It's called the Great Tribulation Period. And the Tribulation Period is what Paul refers to as the wrath that is to come. See also Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 19. Now, understanding that, let me refresh your memory what Paul said, and I read it earlier. He said, as believers, we are to wait for God's Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us, help me, from, not in, but from the wrath to come. And then in chapter 5, he doubles down. For God has not destined us for wrath. That is, God has not destined the church to experience his 
outpouring of wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, salvation in the New Testament is always understood in three tenses. I was saved, I'm being saved, I shall be saved. Justification, sanctification, glorification, and that's what he's talking about here. But obtaining salvation slash glorification through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> back to the text where we started. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Let me revisit this idea that I started with, that these young Christians were losing their hope. Something has happened to them that has affected their sense of hope. And so in chapter 2, verse 1 and following, we are about to be told what it is. However, let me throw in this caveat before I read. Something else has taken place among these believers that has affected them in this way and has made them susceptible to a lie that they have bought into. And that is the fact that persecution has begun to dramatically come upon them. And with persecution, there comes a lot of suffering. And that's, what, that's what's happening. They are presently in the ring of fire. It's very difficult to walk with the Lord and to serve the Lord in Thessalonica at this particular time. And I stress that because I think it will help us to better understand what we're about to read in chapter 2. So let's look at this. He says, Now we request you, brethren, brothers and sisters, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. And so his concern, as you can see, the basis of his request is in regard to the coming of Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Now, what is this gathering? Well, every Bible teacher I know uh, has said the same thing about what this is. Clearly, this is a reference to the rapture of the church because that's our great getting up morning. That's our great gathering together unto him. Let me remind you of what it is. He defined it in the first letter of Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, remember last week, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ, those who are in the grave, will rise first. Then we who are alive, that is living and remain, will be caught up. That's where we get the term rapture. We will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Notice he doesn't say, therefore, warn, warn one another. That's not what he says. This is a teaching of great comfort. This is our gathering together Unto him. This is the exit resurrection of the church, and it's the end officially of what we call the church age of which we're presently living. And so back to 2 Thessalonians now, chapter 2, verse 1. With regard to the coming of our Lord, he says, We request you, brethren that you, look at verse 2, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Notice his concern here, as you can see, is the fact that these young Christians were all shook up. They 
They were disturbed emotionally, and the reason is because someone was trying to get them to believe that the day of the Lord has come. The wrath of God is beginning. You are in the tribulation period. Now, to be more precise, let's think about the day of the Lord. There is in the New Testament what is called the day of the Lord and the day of Christ. They are not the same. They are different. The day of Christ is actually a day and time of completion. It's when uh, the goal has been achieved. Let me show you what I mean. In Philippians 1.6, Paul said, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. You see that? The day of Christ is a time of completion. That's very clear. On the other hand, the day of the Lord is very different. The day of the Lord is this time when God is directly involved into the affairs of humankind, and there is judgment. There is a pouring out of God's wrath. Again, just read Revelation 6 through chapter 19. That's what we're talking about. Let me give you a sample. <clears throat> This is Revelation chapter 6, and Jesus has in his hand this seven-sealed scroll, which reveals God's plan to take back earth and to destroy all evil. So he breaks these seals, and here is the sixth seal. Look at this. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair. And the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. That's dramatic. Then the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the commanders, and the rich, and the strong, and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains, to the rocks, and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? That's what we call the day of the Lord. This is part of it, or the time of God's wrath, or it's also called the tribulation period. Now, I want to read something to you that I think will help put into perspective and understanding of what this coming of the Lord means. Look at this. Michael Smith writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter or in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 If the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ referred to the second advent and not the rapture these believers would not be upset or shaken. They knew that the judgments of the day of the Lord had to precede the second advent. So why all the distress? Furthermore, if they were experiencing the suffering associated with the day of the Lord, the second advent would cause them to celebrate, not be upset. Their suffering would soon be over. On the other hand, if the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ referred to the rapture, and it does, they would have had great cause to be alarmed. If the day of the Lord had begun, it would mean they either missed the rapture or Paul had lied to them and they would not be delivered from the wrath that is to come. Do you see what's happening? 
This is the issue of their distress. Someone had told them that they were in the day of the Lord. They were in the tribulation period, and they missed the rapture. And so notice also there are three ways they received this false information. First, he says uh, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by spirit, that's a reference to demonic influence, or a message, likely that's a reference to a false prophecy that someone could have made. And then he says, or a letter as if from us. Apparently, there was a false letter in circulation. Somehow it was aligned to Paul, making the false claim, saying to the effect that the day of the Lord has come, you're in the tribulation and you miss the rapture. That's the root of their being alarmed. Now, let's watch how Paul handles this. In verse 3, he, he will, in effect, say the tribulation to come is not a part of the church age. It's that 70th week of Daniel that was lost, and we talked about it a few weeks ago. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble, Israel's trouble. And so look at verse 3. Let no one in any way deceive you. For it, meaning the day of the Lord, will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God, Do you not remember that while I was with you, still with you, I was telling you these things? The grammar actually in Greek is is continuous. I was constantly telling you about this. That's what he's saying. Now, let me take you back to verse 3. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, the day of the Lord, will not come unless... The apostasy comes first. Now, the word apostasy, I have it underlined and darkened. It comes from the Greek word apostasia, apostasia. And here's what it means. I'm taking it straight from the uh, dictionary. It means a departure, a falling or moving away from. And so this is the apostasy that is going to come. But what does it mean? Well, it could mean a departure away from biblical truth. And we're certainly seeing that in this day, especially in the Western world. Mainline denominations have abandoned the faith altogether. They have literally given up on the message of the historic Christian faith and the historic Christian lifestyle. Uh, So it could be that, or it could be the departure of the church. What is it then? Maybe it's both. It's interesting to me, the first seven translations of the Bible into the English language, pardon me, they translate the word apostasia as departure. In other words, there will be the departure first. Notice the 1384 Wycliffe translation, the first from Greek and Hebrew into English. So basically, they they say the departure, not falling away as some translations put it. The Tyndale Bible, the same, the Coverdale, the Biza, the Geneva Bible. And then in 1611, the King James Version of the Bible is the first to translate it falling away. Uh, These people right here are some of the heavyweights 
who claim that the word is actually referring to the departure of the church and not the departure away from, from the faith. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I don't think I'm smart enough to make that decision, but I think probably it's both. There is a departure away from the historic Christian message, and this also could very well refer to the departure of, of the church. So look at the rest of this now. Verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the departure, that's literal, comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Now, we know who that is, right? The son of destruction, the man of lawlessness. It's a reference to the coming antichrist personality. This is a person who in his time will lead a worldwide rebellion against God, against the true God, I might add. In fact, <clears throat> Paul says in verse 4, look at this, this man of lawlessness who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object, object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Now, I have to admit, there's a lot in that statement that I, I don't understand. It's hard to, to, to figure out a lot of what's happening here. But if you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, when you see what he calls the abomination that creates desolation. Back in verse nine or 4, that's what Paul is talking about here. And this then is a visual sign to the world that God's judgment has begun and it will bring about the second coming of Jesus Christ. When this man of lawlessness stands in the temple and declares himself to be God. I mean, that would take a lot of chutzpah, to say the least. But this person is led by Satan, filled with Satan, literally, and he will stand in the temple. My guess is he's going to claim to be the Messiah, the true Messiah. And because of what he's able to do, in terms of miracles, etc., people will listen to him and follow him. In fact, look at verse 6. Paul says, And you know what restrains him, that is the Antichrist, so that in his time he will be revealed. Something is restraining this man from being revealed. Verse 7, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And so notice, according to this, the revealing of the Antichrist will only take place when this restraining force is taken out of the way. And so there is a restraining force that prohibit, prohibits the revealing, the, the unfolding of this man of lawlessness. And what is it? Well, Paul tells us in verse 6 that we know what it is. He says, and you know what restrains him. Obviously, it's a reference to God the Holy Spirit, who is at work in society restraining evil, that's the teaching of Romans chapter 1. And also his presence in the church. For example, Jesus said on a couple of different occasions, he said of the church, you are the salt of the earth. He also said you are the light of the world. Now think about that. What does salt do? Well, today we put it on our corn and french fries and it puts a little tang in it, uh, in the taste. I get that. 
But in the first century, salt had this primary function. It was used to pack meat, to pack fish, to stop the spread of corruption and decay. And that's the purpose of the church as the salt of the earth. We are part of that restraining influence against evil. Also, we are the light of the world, Jesus says. What does light do? Light reveals what is real. Turn on the light, you can see things as they really are. That's our function, to turn on the light so that people can see what is right, what is truth. So the church is the salt and light of the earth, but what this is saying is that someday the world is going to know what it's like for the salt and light of the earth, i.e. the church, to be gone. And evil will flourish like never before. And that, of course, is the time when the man of sin is going to be revealed. Look at verse 8. Then, he says, the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. He is no threat to the Lord, as you can see. He speaks the word, and with the appearance of his coming, it's all over. His career is very short. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. Notice this man, this is confirmed in Revelation 13, this man is an individual who is Satan's man from head to toe. He fully belongs and is in league with Satan, our adversary. He continues the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power, signs, and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Notice why this happens, why they perish. Because they did not receive, that word can also be translated welcome, they did not welcome the love of the truth so as to be saved. When I opened my life to Jesus Christ, instantly I had in my heart a love for this truth. How about you? I mean, immediately you, you fell in love with truth and you wanted more and more and more. That's what Paul is talking about. However, look at this, verse 11. Because they weren't able or weren't willing to receive the love of the truth, for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. I believe the deluding influence is already at work. It, it's, it's, in, it's in the fabric of American culture. They will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. In other words, they live for the pleasure that their sin would give them. They were lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. How about you? Whose pleasure do you live for? the Lord's, or are you caught up in living for the pleasure of wickedness, of, of sin? Now, before I finished, I need to take you back to verse 7. <clears throat> Paul says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. What is the mystery of lawlessness that is already at work? Let me read this to you from Charles Pope. The mystery of lawlessness is the mystery of evil. This is behind the rational man's irrationality. Did you catch that? For example, why do we who are otherwise rational creatures 
choose to do that which we know is wrong. Can you relate with that? Why do we choose to do that which we know causes harm to ourselves and others, which endangers us, threatens and compromises our future, and further weakens us? Why do we choose an evil knowing that it is evil? This is mysterious. This is the strange secret of universal evil. Even secular prophets are puzzled by it. What is it about our race that makes it so difficult to correct the conditions that destroy it? Why is drug trafficking so impossible to stop when it's clearly evident what terrible things it does to people? Why is it that alcoholics will return again and again to their habit when they see that it is destroying their homes and families and even their own lives? It is a mystery, the mystery of lawlessness, the strange secret of human evil. Why is it that as the centuries go by, we have made zero progress in curing human wickedness? That's the good question. Look at what's happening in our nation. People are asking everywhere, how did we get to this place where we are? Where today, what I was taught as a young man that was good, all of that is now being referred to as evil. And what I was taught that was evil is now being referred to as that which is good. How do we explain that? How do we explain the division that's in the culture today? I mean, the division is like nothing I've ever seen. I, re- I lived through the 60s. I remember when there was rioting in the streets when Washington, D.C. was aflame and Detroit and Boston and Pittsburgh. All over, cities were ablaze. But it's nothing like the division that is taking place in our country today. How do, how do we explain this? I mean, there are people... There are people in our country who, if our president today was to be assassinated, they would dance in the street. How do you explain that kind of hatred? How do we explain that kind of evil? It's the mystery of iniquity. It's the mystery of God's lawlessness that is permeating American culture. And we're seeing it more and more taking over the reins of human society. There is only one remedy for the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of lawlessness. And that is the mystery of godliness, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the only answer. I think we're going down a bad road as a nation. And evil men will wax worse and worse apart from an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see one or the other. We're either going to see an historic revival like nothing we've ever seen or we're going to see evil men waxing worse and worse. The division will get wider and wider The answer is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's the only thing that took the hatred out of my heart. And believe me, I had a lot of it in there. It's the only thing that caused me to respect other people with whom I have different views and different opinions. It's the only thing that allowed me to be around all kinds of people when before I had so much hate and so much prejudice in my life. It's the love of Christ, Christ in you. That's the answer. And it's the only remedy. It's the only remedy to combat the mystery of lawlessness. So that leads me to ask you the question, what about you? What's in your heart? 
what, what's your life all about? Is Christ in your life? And are you learning to live by his strength and wisdom and power? Or are you still doing life on your terms? Are you still making decisions based only on what gives you pleasure? Or are you making decisions in your life on the basis of what is true? Funny thing, when you live making decisions on the basis of pleasure, you get to experience some pleasure for a moment. It doesn't last very long. But when you make decisions on the basis of truth, in the process of time, the joy of the Lord begins to fill your heart. And you find that the pleasure of walking with God is greater than anything you could imagine on this planet for your life. So how do you live? How do you walk? I want to challenge you this morning to open up your life to Christ, to turn from your old life and embrace Christ, and he will give you the power that you need to turn from the idols that you would submit to. But you have to turn to him first, and I pray that you will. Let's, let's have a prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we ask your spirit to bless these closing moments. It's, it's, a hard, it's a hard life without you. Solomon had it correct when he said in Proverbs, the way of the transgressor is hard. I pray that we would realize today that we need you and you alone to guide and direct us through this life. I pray that our hearts today would say yes to you, that we would make that decision, that we would, as we sang earlier in that song, that we would die today at this moment in this place, that we would die to our old life in order to embrace the new that we can have in Christ. Lord, may the spirit of love and, and mercy be upon us in these closing moments and help us, help us to open up to the love of God in Jesus. We ask it in his holy name. Amen. There was a woman at the close of the first service after we gave the message she came up and she said, I've been coming for weeks and I just needed, needed to do this. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you need to receive the Lord. I, I pray that you will. Let's stand together, folks. I can meet you at the front if you would come. Amen.